Our joy is coming in the morning. In the morning. Can we make this confession tonight, Columbia? Say your life. And bring our joy. We won't submit no more. Depression, you gotta get out of here tonight. Low self-esteem, you gotta get out of here tonight. Because joy is here.
Cause I know joy is I know joy is coming Yes joy is coming Somebody turn in this room Shout like you believe it Shout like you're weeping Good morning. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to UFC's church school session. I am, as always, I'm happy, I'm glad, I'm excited uh, to be before you because God is good and he is magnificent, awesome, and worthy to be praised. And this is an ex uh, uh, exciting, exciting time because this is the end towards, well, Tomorrow really ends. Lent season, it brings in a joyous occasion that our Lord and Savior rose early on Sunday morning. So I don't know about you. I'm excited because just in the celebration, just in the knowing that he cared enough to die for us, it just, it sends chills through me because that's love. Making a sacrifice for the people you love that's love. So I, I can't say enough to that. I am, again, I'm just, I'm just elated. I am just, uh, as, as people say, my cup is running over right now. So you all just excuse me, um, but bear with me this morning. Uh, our lesson uh, for today is the resurrection, key to faith. Before we get started and get deep in that, let us have a word of prayer. Dear God, we come before you this morning. We thank and we praise you for every single day, every single minute, every single second. Lord God, we thank you for all that you have done, all that you're doing, and even the things you're going to do. We thank you for this time, Lord God, that we can celebrate, that we can remember, that we can look and see, Lord God, that it has not been ourselves that's been able to bring us to this day and time, but it's you. Your love, your mercy, your grace has engulfed us, Lord God. You have surrounded us with, with your love and kindness. You have just poured into us, Lord God, your Holy Spirit. Lord God, you have ignited in us, Lord God. Even if we've been going through trials and tribulations, Lord, you have ignited in us a flame, Lord God, that cannot be put out. Lord God, a flame that grows and grows and, and, and intensifies to the point that, Lord God, we want to do your holy will, Lord God. We want to live according to your will and way. We want to, Lord God, carry on as your children, Lord God, spreading the word, Lord God, encouraging others, praying for others, Lord God, uplifting our fellow man, Lord God. We ask that you, Lord God, keep us in remembrance of the fact that, Lord God, you didn't have to do anything for us, Lord God, but that you showed the love towards us, Lord God, that you would allow us, Lord God, to continue, Lord God, and give us chance after chance after chance, Lord God, to know you, to grow closer to you, Lord God, and have a relationship with you. So we thank you on today, Lord God. We cannot thank you enough. And I ask that you would touch and bless each and every one that's listening this morning, Lord God, and those even, Lord, that may not have it on their mind to tune in. It's okay, Lord God, because somebody somewhere is going to get the word out, Lord God, that Jesus has risen, that Jesus died for us, that Jesus lives today that we all have a chance at eternal life. So God, we thank you for everything. And then we ask, Lord God, that you would touch and bless and open up the minds and the hearts of your people to receive in Jesus' name. We pray and we thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 And I'm not going to prolong the time. Again, our lesson for today is the resurrection key to faith. That's found in Mark, the 16th chapter, verses 1 through 8. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So I would like for us to um, just kind of think about the key to faith. 
first of all, the key to faith, we've got to be believers, you all. We got to believe. We got to know that we know that we know that Jesus was not just one, just another prophet. We got to know that Jesus was not just another man, but that he was the son of God in flesh. And you know, that's hard to for people to believe. They rather believe science fiction. They rather believe that an atom exploded, exploded in space and you know, the great bang theory. They rather believe all of this than to believe the truth. But we know the truth and the truth has made us free and the truth has given us the, the, uh, the open door to receive more from the Lord, to receive whatever he has for us, to open up the, the and you know, I, I can't say, to, to open up our minds to receive the truth. And it is, it's mind blowing. When you, when you believe without a shadow of a doubt, when you know that your savior was just not just another man or just another prophet, that he's due the honor, the glory, and the praise that we should and need to give to him. So again, I'm, I'm trying my best not to get carried away. Uh, our uh, lesson today, like I said, the title is The Resurrection Key to Faith. And the beginning of our faith is believing. From there, it grows. Now, what I do want to do is... Um, just remind you that okay, we're not covering the whole chapter of Mark, but we we're hitting and hitting some highlights. Um, now our let me just get this down here. So our first outline is a visit to the tomb, and that's Mark sixteen one through four. Our second outline is he has risen, risen, Mark. 16, five through six. And then our third outline is deliver this message. Meet me in Galilee. Uh, that is Mark 16, seven through eight. And as I say that, I, it makes me think about a song we used to sing, meet me in Galilee. But anyway, again, reminiscing. Um, and this takes place in Jerusalem. And the time is around AD 30. So this, today's portion, we're dealing with the aftermath of Christ's death. We're dealing with the fact that um, Christ has, oh, you all, when I think about it, when Christ came into Jerusalem, they were praising and singing Hosanna in the highest, you know, they were just all so grateful that Christ was there. And in this same place, these the jealous people, the higher ups decided that he was getting too much attention. He was too popular. They couldn't take that. And that drew away or took away from them and their space, their 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 notoriety. That took away from them being the ones that you come to or go to for this and that. It took away from the fact that they they weren't who or they didn't have a place in the people's heart like they thought they did. They weren't the go-to people. So yeah, this, this became a problem. And for the people to draw closer to Christ and not to the authorities, yeah, that didn't really pan out for them. So they couldn't find anything wrong with them. The scribes and the Pharisees tried over and over again to trip him up, to catch him in, in some kind of wrongdoing or even in a lie or uh, uh, even in a blasphemous, blasphemous, blasphemous situation. And it's kind of the thing like with Stephen, but rather Stephen was kind of like Christ in the fact that no wrong could be found. So they had to trump up some charges. They had to lie. They had to make up stuff and even bring in false witness. But they could not, they could not find any fault in him. They could not find fault. So here we have that because they wanted Christ out of the way, they found a way to have him, or they could have any at any moment this could have stopped if Christ wanted it to, but it had to play out. And, you know, we don't understand sometimes why good people wind up in bad situations or 
as other people would say, they've fallen. Um, it's not, Christ did not fall. He did not fail, but he carried out the plan for, for humanity, not just for some, but for all. And whether all receive it or not, or accept it or not, um, it's okay. It's okay because God knows. So in this plan, that meant that Christ had to be tried. He had to be beaten like he was. He had to be tortured the way he was tortured. And then they had the opportunity to release him. They had the choice between Christ and Barabbas. And who did they choose? They chose Barabbas, somebody they knew to be a known criminal, but you choose a criminal over a good man. But again, the plan had to be carried out. So he was crucified on the cross. Now, the thing about it is Christ didn't, Christ didn't hang on there as long as some people do. Uh, he didn't linger. His death was... It carried out, but it was quicker than they expected. It was quicker than it normally would be for people. So um, he suffered, but thanks be to God, he didn't have to suffer long. Now in this, we know that after that, um, we know that after that he was put in the tomb, but we know what happens next. Let's get into the lesson. So our first outline again, that is going to be, Excuse me. Our first line outline is verses one through four, and it's a visit to the tombs. Now, we begin with verse one, and it says, when the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they, could, they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone was very large, had already been rolled away. So you're looking at uh, because of the, the, the beginning of the Sabbath or before the, the Sabbath started, they didn't have time to prepare Jesus' body like it should have been or what, what would be normal to do. They didn't have enough time. So in, uh, in their preparation or in them laying Jesus to rest, all that was, all that was, uh, all the time they had was just to wash away the, the dirt that was on him, wash, you know, kind of they couldn't even tend to his wounds the way that they wanted to. They had just enough time to wash him off just to wrap him. So they didn't even have time to, to, to administer the spices that would have took um, in, in, they didn't have embalming. So they had certain ways that they prepared the body to be laid totally to rest. And they had to wait till after the Sabbath was over before they could do this. They, like I said, they worked in the time frame they had. Now it's important to note that uh, Joseph Arimathias, and I may be saying his name wrong, you all forgive me, but Joseph went and asked for the body of Christ. Now normally what would have happened, Jesus would have been buried with the rest of the thieves. He would not have gotten a, 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 a tomb. He wouldn't have gotten a, a separate burial place or anything like that because those cruci crucified on the cross, they didn't consider them to be uh, of any worth. So they were buried in the same place, in the same area. They didn't get anything special. Like, you know, we we pick out a plot. We have a specific place that we're buried. Uh, we Like I said, nowadays you can pick your own plot and decide where you want to be. Your family doesn't have to do it. You can do it yourself and have certain arrangements made. But see, Jesus' death was not something anybody planned or thought that would happen anytime soon. You know, we, we think that uh, a, a person born, they're going to live a long life and you don't have to worry about this stuff until you get old. But you don't know when your time is up. You don't know when, uh, uh, our, we don't know the day, nor the hour when it's our time. 
We're not made to live here forever. So all of us have a date that we're going to leave this earth. We're going to leave this life. So in this, it was by the grace of God that they allowed Joseph to take Christ's body because, like I said, he was not supposed to be laid separately. He was supposed to be buried with the thieves, the, the, the criminals, so to speak. And in this, he had to petition. He had to he had to beg for the body of Christ. And they allowed. Uh, now, it wasn't something of normal practice, but it was that they, it was like they, um, he was given, it was like he was given uh, Joseph a gift. And um, I'm trying to get back here. I believe it was, was it Pilate that allowed him to take Christ's body? But again, he did this as though he was giving him a gift. You know, it wasn't, it's out of the goodness of my heart. So you should be grateful that I'm allowing you to take this Jesus, you know, and bury him. And Joseph buried him in the tomb that was prepared for himself. Uh, and you do have, even now you, you have people that have family plots where they've, they've uh, carved out a certain area for the family to be buried in. So Joseph had his, he, he was a man of means, but he was also a follower. So even though he was a part of, uh, of <clears throat> the council, so to speak, he, the, uh, uh, I'm sorry, part of the Sanhedrin, even though he was a part of that, he was a believer and he was not one of those believers that shied away from uh, or, or tried to hide it, so to speak. But he stood firm and had to be some kind of man because they didn't bother him. But anyway, <laughs> uh, he had his burial uh, uh, burial place already situated. So he cared enough about Christ that he would lay him in his tomb, that he would have a resting place, not just any old place, but a, a proper resting place. And this is something that was important to the Jews. And this is something that was important to the believers, that their Lord and Savior had a proper place, not just any place, but he was the one that stepped up. And it's by the grace of God uh, that he was allowed and given, uh, allowed to take Christ and lay him in the tomb. So we're looking at here, the women have come to finish the, the burial tradition. Um, they brought the spices because they wanted Christ's final resting to be in a proper manner. And since they couldn't do it before the Sabbath, they went very early after the Sabbath, right after the Sabbath, but at the crack of dawn, so to speak. So Christ had to have risen before the sun even came up. Of course, he was the sun. <laughs> he is the sun. So he he was he had already risen before the sun even came up. And here these ladies come to do a job. They they were diligent. They were now you gotta understand too. It says um let me see. They did this very early in the morning. Now, there is a specific reason why they did this very early in the morning. You got to realize that once things start going and moving in a day, y'all know how it is, uh, between, uh, I would say between one and five in the morning, you can kind of get through streets and even uh, expressways, bypass, all that kind of stuff. You can kind of get through pretty easy because people are not flowing like that yet. But six, is, six o'clock on, things start to get busy and, and you got more traffic and you got more hassles or getting through an area like you would have easily before the time. This is exactly what these women did. They went very early because number one, they did not want to have to uh, answer any questions of where are you going this early in the morning? What y'all got going on? What, what y'all got? You, you know, we get, we, what y'all going to do? You know, questions would have been raised. Uh, eyes would have been on them because once you stop a person and you like 
ask them questions or what have you, it's like, okay, um, all eyes stop. Oh, what, yeah, what's going on? What, what, what they doing? What they doing? Who is that? That's Mary. Uh, yeah, what, wait a minute, where y'all going? A whole lot of commotion would have went on of, over something they did not want to bring attention to because the questions would have started. And then if anybody had the, the, the sense of realizing, oh, y'all got spices, who are y'all going to? Y'all going to see Jesus. You know, it would have been a whole big, uh, uh, whole big uh, commotion over something that they did not want to make known to others. So they went early in the morning. Their mission was to uh, uh, make sure that they did what it took to, um, to take care of Jesus. Because as we look back, we look at that. Mary was, uh, uh, we, we look back at the time where Jesus' feet was washed, or I should say anointed, pre being prepared even for this, for the burial. Then Jesus turned around and washed the feet of the disciples. And, you know, some, some churches, some people still carry on that tradition. And the thing about it is, um, you think about it, your feet are, a source of where you go or how you get to where you go. Your feet even uh, have the capability of absor absorbing things uh, uh, that, that can easily be transmitted through your body. Your feet are an important source, even though you don't think of that it that way. Your feet can be a gateway for things, uh, things happening in your body. So for Jesus to take the time to wash his disciples' feet, and this was a cleansing so that what's absorbed from here on or what's what I've cleaned off, you're free of, you know. So in all this preparation, like I said, it's important to understand that there's a reason. There's always a reason to what Jesus did. It wasn't just the washing of the feet. But again, if the cleansing was at the bottom. It worked its way up. So Jesus will clean. And don't get me wrong. You you can you can start at the top of the head, but usually what we do at the top of the head, we anoint, right? So the the anointing can fall over and flow through. But also there's another entrance way, and that's the feet. We don't always think of that or look at that. We look at the hands because, you know, you get, everybody's got germs, germs are everywhere and all this kind of stuff, but the feet are a source too. And they're very rarely looked at or taken care of in the manner of being clean or being whole or being careful. Their feet, you know, oh, they're covered, you know, but still there, that's another source. You cannot forget that there are all different areas of us that's uh, susceptible to things that we don't want in our bodies, but our feet are also one of those areas. So we got to be careful. So looking at this um, in the preparation, these women wanted Jesus to be totally buried properly. So in going and doing what they did, they weren't trying to so much hide as they were trying to be careful of the fact that because they knew eyes were going to be on Jesus, even though he was dead. They knew that there was going to be conflict because he was dead. But then we're thinking in the physical sense of Jesus being dead. And then some people not realizing who he really was. Uh, so when they, you know, they were on their way, they got everything that they needed. There is early, early in the morning. But the thing was, as they went along the way, they didn't consider the fact that there's going to be a stone blocking that tomb. And who's going to move that for us? I don't think even they realized that the that Pilate or, or that the Romans would have uh, stationed a guard outside his tomb, marked the tomb so if the seal was broken... Um, you know, they would know or or to catch anybody that was trying to move Jesus' body and all this kind of stuff. That wasn't a consideration until they were on their way. And the thing was, 
the stone put in, in across the tomb, it was going to be heavy. It wasn't going to be something lightweight, you know, just because the dead being where they are, they didn't want the aroma or the smell of the body coming forth. And you, they didn't want the bodies to be desecrated so that any uh, creatures, animals or anything like that can get into them. So they, it was blocked. But they asked the question, not knowing what was going to happen when it got there, um, who was going to move it, how are we going to get in there? But they went, you know how you have to, you have to be guided or sometimes you just have to rely on your faith. They just believe somehow, some way, they'll be able to get in there to Jesus. Don't They didn't know how it was going to happen. All they knew is they had to get there. And sometimes in life, everything cannot be planned out. And even if you plan it out, it may not go according to plan. Because you know what? If you want to operate under the will of God, that means that God has the plan. And sometimes we don't know that plan. Sometimes he don't let us in on the plan. And that's okay because he knows what's best for us. So when things don't go according to plan, and you've asked God to take take control of the situation or step in, then you got to know that your plan might not match up with his plan. So so what you plan a trip and you plan to leave at a certain time, but you find yourself behind that time. Sometimes it's not God's plan that you leave at that time, but leave at a different time. Sometimes on that trip, Whatever could have happened or would have transpired, God has kept you from it. Sometimes on whatever situation we we deem necessary that there has to be this specific plan to go according to, God has changed the plan. But I'd rather go according to his plan because, see, he sees what we don't see. He knows what we don't know. So I'd rather go his route then you know how some people, if you don't go according to plan, they get really upset. They 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 just they're time conscious. So if you're not going according to the plan, or they're so plan oriented, to, they don't like deviating from the from the plan. But you'll find in this Christian journey that your plans may not always go according to God's will. So something's got to give. We're going to go according to our plan or his will. So sometimes you just got to take a breath and say, okay, God, what is your will? What is your way? What do you intend for me to do? Or how do you intend for me to do this? Which way should I go? Trust God knows what he's doing. He always does. It's us that don't know what's ahead, what's around the corner, what's in the future. And when people tell you that they can tell you your future, go the opposite way. Go the opposite way because I don't even want to know or hear what you have to say because you are not my God. Anyway, that's another topic of discussion. All right, before we finish up with this, let me look here. I And I, you all, again, because of the excitement of this lesson and everything, I have deviated from the norm. I do want to say good morning to Sister Galloway. Good morning to Minister Lauren. Uh, good morning to Sister Perry. Good morning to everyone. I apologize. You all, please forgive me. But I was so excited about this lesson that I just took off. You know, I, I you know, Minister Lauren kind of helps me to be grounded. So I get excited and I just run right ahead. So forgive me. But I, I thank and praise God for you all being with us this morning. God bless you. Um, and again, charge that to my head, not to my heart. Uh, I love you all. And you know that I'm excited whenever you all join me. Uh, you know, you hear preachers say, I, I, I feel my help coming in the room. You well, know, when I have you ladies and any of you, anybody that listens in, tunes in, uh, I feel like that gives me more strength. That gives me uh, uh, encouragement. And I thank you for that. I appreciate you. God knows I do. And any comments that you make, I am grateful again for you all being here with me this morning. Um, and as I carry on, uh, I think we have covered the first outline um, 
uh, da, 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 yes, we're ready for the second outline. The second outline being, I just passed it. Okay, the second outline being, he has risen. The fifth and the sixth verse, let me just see here. Um, because Minister Lauren tried to set me up, y'all, and sometimes I can't follow because she's better at this stuff than I am. And rightly so. So a lot of things I might not put on the screen or might not have on the screen. Y'all forgive me. <laughs> y'all just y'all pray for me. That's 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 all I can say. Y'all pray for me. Okay, so let's get into our second outline. My favorite part. He has risen. Uh again, that's verses five and six. Um, and let me get back there. There we go. Verse five. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side and they were alarmed but he said to them do not be alarmed you are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified he has been raised he's not here look there is the place they laid him all right now y'all imagine you know I just I have to take you to to um because see growing up I was like Y'all know Jesus said he was going to be raised from the dead. So why are y'all shocked about anything? That, but you also have to put yourself in their shoes. You've got these women going to the tomb to take care of Jesus' body. They get to the tomb. Number one, the stone is already rolled away. Number two, they go in and then there's somebody there that's uh, not laying down dead, but alive and sitting <laughs> on the right side of the slab Jesus would have been laying on. So would not that kind of shake you a little bit, you know, kind of scare you a little bit? Okay, what's going on and what does this mean? Uh, it, it's, it's one of those things where um, you, you, you're startled. I mean, you're shaken. You're, you know, you don't know what to feel right then because you're like, okay, uh, don't know why he's here. Where's Jesus? What's going on? What has he done? Who is he? And the the where other people or where where people see outside of what what they're what they're reading, they see they see you should have known it was an angel because they dressed in white and blah blah. Think about it. You're startled. Do you normally think like that? Do you normally put things all in perspective at the one time? No, we are feeling feeling beings. We are emotional beings. And the emotion there is fear because I don't know who you are. We're in the tomb and why are you alive and in it? And where's Jesus? So yeah, you got some heightened emotions here. So the first thing, uh, first thing is he realizes this and the the angel wasted no time addressing, don't be afraid, don't be alarmed, and then goes into explaining. You're looking for Jesus, but he's not here. He's risen. He, you know, this is the place where he did lay, but he's risen. He did what he said he was going to do. The thing about it is, you know how you hear people and they tell you things and you're like, okay, yeah, you know, and you're hearing them, but when things actually play out, it's, you're like, wait a minute, you know what? So-and-so did say that, but you don't, you don't take heed to it at the moment. You don't take it from what, for what they're saying at the moment. And, you know, and even in your loved ones, I don't know about you, but there are some things for me that came to mind after Bishop passed, after, you know, kind of getting in a state where I can kind of accept, well, not accept, because, you know, it's, that's a, death is always hard. I don't care who you are and who you, you know, say you are and how close you are to God. Death is hard. It's hard on everyone. But you recall things after the fact. You know what? He said this. You know, for a year he was trying to prepare us. And, you know, you think on things that they said before. So at the time, 
it's hard to get past the emotions of what you're dealing with right then in your grief or in 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 uh, 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 tragic situations or even in um, just things that happen. It's hard to remember or hard to recall things at that moment because you're in the moment. In the moment, like I said, with us being emotional beings, you don't you're all over the map sometimes. And it's hard to get a grip on what your feelings and, and, and what to remember or what to even think. So even the women going to the tomb didn't recall that Jesus said, on the third day, I will rise. You know, think of the disciples. You know, I, I used to I used to be upset with the disciples. I'm like, if anybody should have been in that tomb, you all should have been at the tomb. I was like... Y'all know him. You walked with him, everything. Why weren't you at the tomb? But again, if you're in a grieving state, it's kind of hard to do what somebody standing on the outside looking in can do. You 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 can't even can't all you can remember, all you can think about is they're gone. I I, I can't, they were just here. They're gone. So it's, it's, it's a lot of processing that goes into that. So I had to learn to remember that the dis disciples were human too. So yes, they would go through some things. And this, the angel gave them a little relief in knowing that Jesus had risen, that he did, he did what he said he was going to do, rise on the third day. And to recall, start recalling this, it was, again, shocking at first because he's not there and somebody else is. And then it was relief and knowing that this has got to be an angel to, you know, to realize who the angel was and to realize what message that was being given. Now, uh, if y'all don't mind, I'm going to go ahead and skip to the third outline or go on to the third outline. Deliver this message. Meet me in Galilee, verses six and seven. Um, verses six and seven. I'm, I'm sorry, seven and eight. Seven and eight. Y'all forgive me. Verses seven and eight. Um, and in verse seven, it says, But go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb for terror and amazement had seized them and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Okay, so now you're looking at after after getting over the initial shock and the angel coming, the angel calming them, now you have the angel telling them to you've got to deliver a message to the disciples. Uh you got to go tell them that he's going ahead of them to Galilee. And he had told them that previously. But again, in a grief state, it's kind of hard to make sense of things. So here he's telling them, you need to go tell them he is already on his way to Galilee. They need to go and meet him there. So, and they, in their state is like, they had to believe that Jesus has risen. He's not laying there. There's an angel telling us. So you got a bunch of emotions going on now. Now you've got them excited. Now you got them in amazement of what's going on. Oh my God, my savior is, is alive. And then you got the fear. Okay. I, we, we, we got, a, uh, and, I, and it's not the same as fear, fear, but you got this, we're on a mission. Um, we can't stop. We got to go directly to the disciples. Now that's, now that's, that's, actually being on the mission for the Lord. You can't stop. You can't explain to somebody else what you got to do, but you got to get it done. So that means that bypassing anything and anybody to get to what they had to do, which was get to the disciples. Now, the thing about it is they obeyed to the T. They did exactly what they were told to do. They did this without any hesitation, which means they believed that Jesus was risen. And then he says, you're going to be, you will see him in Galilee. So to run and tell them that I have to, I have to come back to a point where I have to direct um, here in verse. Y'all forgive me. Hold on just a moment. Here in verse seven, I 
skip right over it. Okay, he says to them, but go tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. Now it's really important for for um, to pull out that he says, excuse me, that he says, go and tell his disciples and Peter. It's important to pull that out because as we recall, Peter did just what Jesus told him he was going to do. He was going to deny him three times before the cock crow, crowed twice. Now, the thing about it, can you imagine the state that Peter was in? Number one, he fulfilled the prophecy of what, you know, he fulfilled this by actually doing what Jesus said without even thinking about the fact what he was doing or even that he was doing it. He didn't think about it until after the cock crowed. So here you got, he denied Jesus three times and adamantly, you know, each time being worse than the, the, the time before. And then to recall that Jesus told you you were going to do this. Can't you imagine the guilt trip that he was going through and that he denied his Savior? It's just like uh, 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 he, he was trying to, trying to save himself because even though he was trying to see what was going on with Jesus or what was happening, he also did not want to go be caught. He didn't want to be caught because he didn't know what was going to happen if he did say or admit. He might have been in the same thing. So he's fearing for his life. The thing about it is for him to have actually done what Jesus said, brought the guilt along of, oh, can you imagine, OMG, I did just what I did not. I, and this he had to carry through all of the, the, the torture that Jesus went through to him going to Calvary, to him even being on the cross and dying. He had to carry the fact that I lied. I denied him. I said I didn't know this man. And that was my friend. That was my Lord and Savior. Savior, And I, I, I did the worst that I could do. I disowned him. I disowned him. And now he's going through all this and now he's dead. So his grief was even more so, not just losing a friend, but he did the worst that he could do is follow out what Jesus said without even realizing he did it until after the fact. So yeah, this and what he was saying and what the, the angel was telling them to do, go tell the disciples and Peter, there was a hidden message in there. There was a redemption message in there when he said this. This, this was forgiveness coming forth even, uh, or it, it was... Uh, um, getting you off, letting, letting you off the hook kind of thing for him to include or separate Peter from the disciples because Peter had already separated or, or should I say he felt like he was not a part anymore because of what he, he did. And then for, he can't go back and say, I'm sorry because Jesus died. So how can you ask for forgiveness? And he's gone. So here you have in what what they're the message that they're carrying and in saying what they're saying, this is a, a, a indirect way of letting Peter know you're forgiven. You are part of this. You you along with the disciples, not just the disciples, but you too need to meet him in Galilee. So this was, like I said, this was a hidden message of forgiveness on Peter's part, and it was directed to, and can you imagine the me message that they did take to him? He must have felt like, he must have felt the message, the hidden message in the message, because they went running. Number one, they went running to the tomb to see for themselves that Jesus was not there. And then number two, they met him or went to Galilee so that they could meet Jesus. Now, the thing about it is you got to realize that Jerusalem hold, held no kind of uh, 
no kind of love, no kind of support, no kind of anything for Jesus and the disciples, except for when they came into Jerusalem. Jerusalem was not significant for uh, uh, that it was like going to another place. Now we we visit places, right? We go from here with it, but there's nothing significant enough to hold us there because that's not what feels like home. So them being in Jerusalem was not some place they needed to stay. So they had to leave from there. Galilee was their 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 uh, uh, center. There that that was where they would be safe. They would be uh, accepted. They would be uh, welcomed. But Jerusalem was not that place. So they didn't need to meet in Jerusalem. They needed to get away from Jerusalem. And Galilee was the point that Jesus needed them to be so that they they they, they could be in a uh, uh, an area of freedom that God I mean Jesus knew what they needed to be so that they can carry out or that he could finish his mission that prepared them for the missions that they had to take on so it's important to know that yeah they needed to meet in Galilee Jerusalem they were done they were done in Jerusalem now it's time to go and finish out and carry out their uh, their teaching, so to speak, because Jesus had a little more, a little more to carry over or to teach them or to give them before he ascended. So, yeah, they had a little more time with him. But is like I said, all of this put together is such a magnificent history. You know, I, I I I would say story, but this is not a story. Story. This is history. This is reality. Whether men want to accept it or not, this is our reality as Christian as as Christians. This is our history as Christians. So this is something we can't keep within. We can't hide, and we can't uh, just keep it to ourselves. It's got to be known. It's got to be spread. Yes, Jesus died but he rose again. He didn't stay dead. He rose again for us. He rose again so we can have a chance. He he came so we could have an example of how we should be, how we should walk, how we should talk, how we should treat our fellow man even, even in the face of adversity. He never said a mumbling word that or argued with the... <laughs> or argue with anybody about the message that he was bringing. He didn't have to. You know, I, I found that there's more peace sometimes in keeping my mouth closed than to speak, especially when somebody's trying to come up against you. Sometimes it's not a battle for you to fight, but it's, uh, it's in the humbling yourself that God can work do the work. Sometimes he don't need you to step toe to toe to somebody to prove who you are, to show who you are, or uh, make your point. Sometimes you don't need to make a point. You know what? The scripture even says, agree with a fool while he's in his way. When somebody is acting foolish or being foolish and trying to uh, uh, cause an explosion, so to speak, with everybody, sometimes you just have to say, okay, because you know what? A person cannot argue with themselves or by themselves. So sometimes you just have to be quiet and just say, okay, you can get that person calmed down a lot quicker, just okay, or being quiet. Then you can't send something to them to try to convince them of something they're not going to hear anyway. So Sometimes you do have to agree with the fool while they're in their way, just so peace can be had. And once that's done, they're going to shut up because they have nobody to argue with. They have nobody to fight with. So we have to remember, humble is the way. And if we need to fight, God will let us know when it's time to fight. God will let us know when it's time that we need to fight. But a lot of battles belong to the Lord and not us. 
So I'm praying that you have gotten something out of the lesson. Um, this uh, this has been, like I said, this has been just, um, it's been awesome for me. Uh, I um, y'all y'all bear with me because, like I said, uh, Minister Lauren always uh, puts up stuff and. Apparently right now I'm messing this stuff up because I can't find what I'm looking for. Uh, but I just want you all that when you all go in on tomorrow and you teach your lessons or you're there for the lesson, go in there with joy. Go in there with joy knowing that, hey, uh, I got something to celebrate. It's not just another Sunday. It's not just another day. This is our day that we celebrate Christ being risen. Don't get me wrong. We ought to celebrate every day. But this is a particular day that we can share in this celebration, that we can remember to together, that we can praise together, that we can uplift the, the name of the Lord together. And that ought to be every time too. <laughs> but let's take this time to recognize that Christ rose for us that Christ lives now for us. Uh, uh, again, let me just remind you, uh, let's see, on tomorrow, tomorrow, you all, 11 o'clock service is at uh, is at 11 a.m. Uh, I'm sorry, I should have said morning worship is at 11 a.m. And tomorrow night, uh, kicking it with the family. Now we may be a little behind. We'll post that to let you know. Uh, we may have to move our time to seven tomorrow. But kicking it with the family, will we? Will we? Will we? We'll be back tomorrow. <laughs> I can't even talk. You all forgive me. Uh, so join us tomorrow at 11 and join us tomorrow at 6 for kicking it with the family. And then we're right back here next Saturday at 11 a.m. I'm sorry, 10 a.m. for our church school session. Next week's lesson is entitled, and we're still in faith, y'all, Faith of Four Friends. Um, that's going to be found in Luke, the fifth chapter, verses 17 through 26. Faith of Four Friends. That's next Saturday, 10 a.m. Join us. And I can't thank you enough for being with us today. I thank and praise God. I tell you, like I said, this has been so uplifting as far as um, the lesson. This has been just, it, it, it's been a blessing, y'all. And it still is a blessing. And I'm just, I'm so full because this, this is, this, it, it becomes personal when you know Jesus died for you, when you know he rose again for you. It becomes personal and you can't help but walk around with a smile on your face and in preparation of celebrating with your brothers and your sisters. So um, you all have a, a wonderful and great uh, Resurrection Day on tomorrow. Um, let me just um, let me close out with a word of prayer. And again, I love that um, Minister Lauren always tries to prepare me for everything, but I don't always remember how to put it in order like she does. But um, let us close out with the word of prayer uh, and let's bow our heads. Dear God, we thank you for this lesson. We thank you for everything that you have blessed us with, filled us with. I'm praying that somebody out there feels the joy that I'm feeling, Lord God, and just knowing that you've already prepared the way for us, Lord God, you have already directed, uh, have our, our plan, your plan mapped out for us, Lord God, that you know and in advance, Lord God, what we're going to face, what we're going to deal with, Lord God, what's going to come up. And you already have a plan made out on how we can get through it and how we can escape and how we are covered by you, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for loving us that much that you look out for us. We thank you that you shelter us from the worst of any situation, Lord God. We thank you that you cover us, Lord God, when the enemy tries to, to, to attack us or the enemy tries to destroy us, that you cover us 
us, Lord God, that you protect us, Lord God, from hurt, harm, and danger, that, Lord God, even in the worst circumstances, they could be worse if it had not been for you, Lord God. So we thank you, Lord God. We ask that you would touch and bless each and every one, Lord God, households, Lord God, touch and bless bodies right now, Lord God, because see, there's things going on within us, Lord God, we don't know about and we don't know how to fix God, but you do. So we trust you, Lord God, to help us to know when we need to trust the doctors, Lord God, and when we need to know, Lord God, what to do ourselves, for ourselves, Lord God. So we ask, Lord God, that you would touch and bless families, bless homes, bless Lord, jobs and situations, Lord God, touch and bless, Lord God, whatever we're dealing with or going through, Lord God, Lord, help us to remember that you're with us no matter what we face, Lord God, and what we have to deal with. We know, Lord God, we're victorious because we're your children. We're victorious because you are our Father. We're victorious because Jesus is our Savior. We're victorious because we have the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us. And we thank you, Lord God, and we'll forever give your name the praise and uplift your name. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. Amen. Amen. You all have a blessed rest of the day and we will see you next time. God bless you. I love you.